Leibovich, welcome back to The Daily Show. Trevor, thank you for having me. And you. congratulations on another number one New York Times bestselling book. Um, this, this is really interesting for me because you, you, you're one of the best writers out there, not just because of how you write, but how you capture the world that you observe, and it's politics, you know? Talking about Trump, talking about the Republicans, talking about the Democrats and how they respond. But this book is really interesting because it's about the hold that Donald Trump has on the Republican Party. And you talk about it in a way that I think few people understand. Tell me why it's servitude and not just him being the head honcho. Because the Republican Party has surrendered to Donald Trump. I lost my voice last night. I was up all night. But I understand. they have surrendered. <laughs> all and this is not another book about Donald Trump. This is a book about the party that enabled him. Right. This is a book about the people who bowed down to him, who could have stopped him, and yet continue to underperform in elections like they did last night. And the reason is Trump is sort of an anchor around their necks, and no one is standing up to them. And I wanted to give readers a sense of what this looks like. You, you've given us more than just a sense, because we, we saw a glimpse of this when, when, the, you know, when the primaries were still taking place. You had all these Republicans who were like, Trump is not the Republican right. Party. All of them, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, Lindsey Graham. He was on the show saying, Donald Trump will never be the face, I will never support, all these things. Right. Trump wins, and almost overnight, everybody falls into line. Everybody becomes pro-Trump. But what you show us in the book, because of the interview, some people anonymous, but some people on the record, yeah. saying, no, we hate this guy, but we care about winning more than anything else, so we we're gonna work to keep him in power. It's such a weird dynamic. I, I was stunned by what they said to me, both on the record and, and obviously the dirty little secret inside Washington is that most Republicans who absolutely, um, you know, just bow down to him in public, trash him in private. And there were a lot of people last night in the Republican Party who are saying, Donald Trump did this. This is another election he coughed up for us. He's the first president in 100 years to lose the White House, mm -hmm. the House, and the Senate. Um, they underperformed in another election last night. Right. But they're only saying it privately. I will think that this spell has been broken when I see some people actually speaking publicly about what he's doing to the party. You, you know... It's interesting that you say that because... Because as, as we read through these conversations in the book, and, and, you know, I love how the book sort of starts with the Trump Hotel and what it represents, a moment in time, a moment where he's at his peak and how people literally come and physically almost bow to his shrine. And then at the end where it's now, you know, uh, almost like a, a, a vacated version of its former self. Yeah. But, but the party seems different in that Republicans are murmuring, but nobody's saying it. You, you see what people are saying online. Oh, it wasn't ideal that Trump did this. It wasn't, you know, they're scared of him, though. Because yeah. they've given him the party, or he's taken it, but they seem scared of him. And, and it's been depressing to watch play out over all these years. What I was scared about was yesterday's election being the red wave that so many people anticipated, uh -huh. which would have vindicated all of this. It would have vindicated the character flaws, the weakness, the patheticness that so many of them, who could stop it, and if there were 10 Liz Cheney's, it would wow. be different. But there's only one. I, I think it, it also illuminates something that's actually... I mean, I don't even know how to say this correctly, but it's weird because Trump is almost more honorable than they are. Because, I mean, he says what he's saying. He does what he's doing. Yeah. They say what they're saying in private, but then they do what he's doing in, yeah. in public. And so, you know what I mean? Where does that leave a country where lawmakers don't believe what they're voting for, don't believe what they're, what they're kowtowing to. Like, where does that leave America, and how do they feel about the position that, that they're putting the country in? Right. I mean, what does it say about a party when Donald Trump is the honorable one, right? <laughs> and, and, and also, given how vulnerable Democrats were last night, how unpopular Biden is, how bad inflation is, mm -hmm. all those issues, to still, you know, underperform to the degree they did gives you an indication of how you know, voters are saying, like, we don't like this either. In mm -hmm. fact, we, we like this worse. So I think, you know, it's all, again, it's all relative. But, but where do you think this goes now? Even, even, you know, not just as somebody who talks to them, somebody who analyzes, somebody who's been in many of the rooms where these discussions are being held. It feels like, you know, you watch Fox News now and you can see people being a little more vocal, saying, DeSantis is clearly yeah. the future. DeSantis is the guy we should be going with. DeSantis, DeSantis, DeSantis. But there's still a, you know, but Trump, but Trump, but Trump. And, 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 and it seems like unless Trump steps down, you have one of the craziest quotes I've ever seen 
from somebody who's a lawmaker who said, you say, what is your plan for 2024? And the person says, dead serious, yep. our plan is to hope that he's dead by then. Right. No, this is, what, this, this is it, a quote. It's a quote. It's um, a quote. They're saying this. They're like, it, we, we it, don't have another way. We don't know what to do. It's crass. It's depressing. But it also goes to the passivity of what these folks are doing. Someone else will take care of the problem. And even now, no one has spoke up. All of the, like I said earlier, all of the criticisms of Trump have been private. So I, I just don't think, and these are weak people, Trevor. These are, these are people who have sold, I mean, whatever they've sold. They, they have given up. I mean, it's the price of submission. Right. Um, as Lindsey Graham said to me, if you don't want to be reelected, you're in the wrong business. Um, and, you know, at a certain point, you sort of ask, is it really worth it? Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it really illuminates I think many of the things that are wrong with American politics in that it has become more about staying in the job as opposed to doing the job that somebody has put you in. Absolutely. And, and it leaves the country in a place where every, everything is for show, everything is for an idea. So, you know, when, when you look at it now, just hearing the whispers, hearing everybody, you know, or even the people speaking publicly to you, is this the moment where the party says, okay, it's gonna be a Ron DeSantis, or are they still just waiting to see what Trump decides to do with the Republican Party? You know, I've had a lot of moments where I've thought the fever is going to break. If January 6th didn't do it, if him losing to Joe Biden didn't do it, huh. I don't think this is going to do it. Wow. Wow. And so, as somebody then who, who, who talks to these politicians, I would love to know where you see it all going from here. Because, you know, on, on the one hand, you have the Democrats who have Joe Biden. And I remember you, you wrote, uh, you know, an article by Joe, about Joe Biden, which really blew up over the summer, and it was about him being too old to run in 2024. And yeah. you said, you said, hey, Joe, you've done what you said you want to do. I broke the story that he's old. <laughs> <laughs> Full credit. <laughs> You know, but, but, but you, were, you came out and you said something that got, you know, got you a lot of flack, but also had many people say, yeah, I didn't want to say that, but, but, but it's true. Because I don't know if people remember, Joe Biden said, I only want to run to, to right. beat Donald Trump, and that's all I'm doing. And now it seems like he, he may want to run again, but you're one of the first people to say, don't run again. My question to you then becomes, what do the Democrats do? Because on the one hand, Yes, Joe Biden is old. On the one hand, yes, he may have only been the person to beat Trump, et cetera. But on the other hand, an incumbent has a feeling of it's the status quo. People don't like presidents changing all the time. That's why Trump losing was such an right. anomaly. So what do you think the option is for the Democrats? Is there not a risk that if they put someone else up, that person is just now a toss-up in the election? Yeah, I mean, the thing about Trump is that he's not only made the Republicans scared, he's made the Democrats risk-averse. They're afraid of trying someone new or exciting or different. I mean, Joe Biden, his most important contribution to the Democratic Party and arguably to the country was beating Donald Trump on November 3rd, 2020, mm -hmm. whenever it was, whenever election day was. <laughs> Fix that. Um, so the problem is governing is a bit of a bitch afterwards, right? right? As, as right. we sort of learn. You know, he might be called upon to do it again. Um, but, you know, it's not like the Democrats have an obvious and deep bench. But I did believe that if some of the people like Tim Ryan were to somehow win last night, they would immediately emerge. And, you know, maybe a John Fetterman, right, you know, maybe right. a Pete Buttigieg, maybe a couple of yeah, others. Yeah, well, and, and, and to your point about being risk averse, I mean, the history of the Democratic, Democratic Party has shown that they've often had the fresh off the bench person. Yeah. You know, Barack Obama was, was like the young senator, and you know, and you, you look at all these right. other, Bill Clinton was the young upstart, people didn't expect it, so maybe that is where the path lies in, is in taking a little uh, risk. But from what your book, it? it seems like nobody wants to take the risk, and it seems that because of that, the country is in a really scary place because um, it feels like it's risk averse and yet heading to the riskiest place of all. Indeed. Well, uh, on that note, it's a really fun beach read. <laughs> It is an amazing book. I'll tell yeah. you that. Congratulations again. Thank, Thank you so much you. for joining me on the show. I hope your voice gets better. We'll see you again. Thank you for your servitude. It's available now wherever you get your books.